Uh, so, I am Rory Sheehan, and I work for Monaghan County Council. I was due to be giving this presentation jointly with Shirley Clerken, the Heritage Officer, but unfortunately, Shirley can't be with us today. She's a uh, little under the weather. Um, so, I'm going to talk to you then about the CAM project, what it is, and uh, who, what we're doing. And it's going to be quite parochial. I'm going to talk to you about Monaghan and my experiences so far. Um, my wife's from Monaghan, and I'm going to tell you about what we've learned. And that picture there is Sleeve Bay, so I'm going to tell you where I'm focused, pretty much up there in North Monaghan. And um, first off, I go to kind of just launch into a little bit, talk about Sleep Bay, how it's, a, it's very much a human uh, managed landscape. Some of the, uh, the designation of the Natura 2000 sites up there. The legacy kind of at the border, that's a really big kind of issue in that area. Um, some of the cultural heritage, and then maybe just a few suggestions for the future, I'll talk. Um, that little curly chick uh, is, we believe, may have been the only curly chick to make it out of a nest in County Monaghan last year. That picture is taken by uh, Joe Shanahan, who works at the Curly Project. Just to give you an idea that the curlew is a very um, a bird that's very much under pressure in Ireland. You know, the people would have people would have hated the sight of curlews in their fields because there were so many of them back in the 70s and 80s. And now we we think we only have one chick in the entire county last year, but that's not directly uh, relevant. So, can so it's the uh, collaborative action for nature and network is the project's name, and um, we are a consortium of different people. So. We have, uh, we're based in the north of Ireland, the Republic of Ireland and Scotland. There are educational institutes such as IT Sligo and um, Ulster, University of Ulster. Then we have local authorities such as Modern County Council. The lead agency in all this is Newry, Morn and Down County Council. And then there's environmental charities like Ulster Wildlife and the Golden Eagle Trust. And then we have the Eastern Border Region. Also ACT in, you know, over in Scotland, the Argyll and Coast Trust, I think they're a um, another environmental charity. Uh, James Moran, who's with us today, he would have been instrumental in the initial stages of putting this project together, but he's since moved on from the, from the project. Uh, we are funded by Interreg 5A, which is uh, administered by the Special European Programmes Body. They like to be mentioned. So just to give you an idea, it is very much across the uh, Republic of Ireland and the, um, into Scotland. This map's a little bit light. So we've got sites all the way up in Scotland, and then sites in the north of Ireland, and then into the Republic of Ireland. And Sleep Bay is just here, it's site 24 in Monaghan, so it's fairly northern within the Republic. And the, uh, there are a number of different sites, or a number of different deliverables we're working towards. So we're trying to protect some species, we're trying to protect some habitats, and uh, they kind of vary. So we would have, they're all working within our designated sites, within our Nature 2000 sites, and all of our targets have to apply to works carried out in those sites, or if it's outside the site, it has to be directly applicable to the site, say connected to it. Um, so we'll be working towards, as the Cameron project as a whole, we'll be working towards sites such as Loch Arrow, which would be a freshwater site, and then we would have fens, uh, we would have raised bogs, and we would have upland blanket bogs. And then over into Scotland, uh, we would have, so there's islands there such as Isla. So it's a real mixture of different uh, different aspects, but I'm just going to talk about Monaghan and what's going on in Monaghan. And my job is just focused on Sleeve Bay, Monaghan, Tyrone, and Fermanagh. So it's a cross-border area, and it's an upland area within uh, the north, within North Monaghan and Tyrone. So we need to deliver lots of different things. Some of our species we're working towards will be uh, the hen harrier, the red grouse, uh, golden plover. So we'll be breeding waders in the uplands, and then also within the fresh waters, they're trying to uh, work towards conserving. Uh, crayfish and just the de general condition of some of our uh, calcareous lakes. Um, so financially, again, as I said, the money is coming from the European government, the Special European Programmes body, our, our uh, taskmasters who delivered that money out to us. There's about €8 million Euros worth of funding between Scotland, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, Monaghan County Council have got about €870,000 just for the Sleeve Bay site, which is in uh, between Monaghan, Fermanagh and Tyrone. Monaghan and County Council are pretty much the lead when it comes to working in that Sleeve Bay area, but we also have partners uh, who are working very much with us on that, it would be Ulster Wildlife, the Golden Eagle Trust, and AFI, the Agri Food and Bioscience Institute up in, um, in Scotland. And they all have different skill sets, they have different roles, we're divided into different work packages and they deliver different onto different work packages. So this is just a map here of Sleeve Bay, just to give you an idea. So it's across the border. I don't really like to put the borderline on that because um, it's not relevant to the birds. They don't really uh, consider the bird the board important. So we've got our big blue area here is our SDA in the north of Ireland. That's, that's uh, entirely in the north. Our yellow area is our SDA in the Republic. 
And then within inside that, we have a national heritage area in the Republic, and it juts up into the north, well, it juts up quite far. And then we have a, a different shaded area there, which is an SAC in the north of Ireland. So you can see there's a lot going on in that area, in that big upland site. The SPAs are very large, they're big areas. Like, so this is just some older satellite imagery. So this is just a slightly zoomed in. So pretty much what you're looking at here is our NHA and our SAC. And you can see this, it's, it's a nice little island site, an upland site. And we have forestry pretty much skirting all around the flanks of the site there. And then very much intensive agriculture. Anyone who's been to Mana knows that uh, there's very much intensive agriculture all in and around the area there. Just from a cultural point of view, I think uh, the big, one of the big cultural icons um, in Mona and, and really relevant to people who live in Mona, Big Tom, he died there during the week, uh, his funeral was on today, and I would live in a very, you know, I live quite close to Big Tom, and you know, he's very, he would have been thought of very highly, and that's a really, you know, Irish country western music is, is, is very big, in particularly in County Mona, and if you're, anyone who's ever been in the Glen Caron Hotel, almost every night of the week you can see a different Irish country or western act, and people will travel from all around the country to see that, and that's really relevant to people who live there. Like, so our sites that are kind of designated up in uh, up in Mana, we'd have Blanket Bog, we'd have Dry Heat, we've got our some natural dystrophic lakes, and we have then some more legotrophic uh, water bodies. And that's really what the CAM project in Mana is working towards. Very much the Blanket Bog really is kind of the underpinning thing. It's what we have most of in Sleep Bay. And um, then we have some species. I've just kind of got a general list of species, but the ones that are really important to us would be our hen harriers, um, our golden plover. We used to have Greenland white-fronted goose, they no longer visit the site. Um, curlews are in a pre precipitously uh, low numbers adjacent to the site and into the SBA. So our hen harrier really is the, uh, it's, it's, it's the, it's the number one bird. The hen harrier is, 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 depends on who you talk to, it's either a bad word or it is a beautiful bird. Like, and that is really where you have that intermixing between culture and uh, you know, cultural heritage, people making their lives, natural heritage. Like. So I think last year in the Republic section, the Republic site of uh, Monon, there may have been four nests, four hen harrier nests, which is very low numbers. It's not a very large uh, upland site for hen harriers in the Republic, but in the north, again, it's, it's much larger. And these are just some pictures I bring. Uh, you know, this is a slide I show when I kind of go to schools. It's a very different, um, it's a very different audience. I'm used to, I've been talking over the last couple of weeks, I've been visiting primary schools in the area. I've been talking to some of the, the primary schools. That's a different, uh, a different kind of talk. I get all the kids to get up out of their seats and pretend to be red grouse and make red grouse noises and the, the teachers hate me because the kids are hyper by the time I've left the class. Like, so this is um, just an idea of some of the um, some of the cultural legacies that exist. So if you go to the north side of Sea Bay, that's an old turf extraction machine that's rusting up there. Beautiful piece of equipment. Uh, the old engine is still with us. And that would have dug up the turf, dug up the peat, pumped it out of the site. So that's there and that's the legacy and you can go and you can see strips that have been dug of, of peace that we dug down to the bare mineral soil, and that's very much still there. Like, um, you know, as uh, you know, as was said earlier, it's very much none of our habitats in Ireland are uh, natural habitats. They're all very much human influence and human control, and very much on the uplands. And the history of the uplands. This is again a picture of my legs there. That's burning. And the big fires we had this time, almost this time last year, or May of last year. And that soil is, or the peat has been burnt down to burnt down to the bare mineral soil there, and that's been carried out by people who are lighting, lighting those fires. And these are some of the historic legacy issues and some of the current issues, and burning is very much a, a, an issue. I suppose, leading on from the iron, you, when you're, you're thinking about the, um, a lot of the learnings that came into developing the, uh, the CAM project have been taken from the Burn project and the Iron Life project, and then the results-based agri-environmental project in Sligo, and that is really, the stuff that's been learned in those projects has, has been used to feed into the development of the CAM project and how we interact with landowners and very much the recognition that landowners are, are, are the key and they really are the people you need to get on board and how we deal with that. And we have, as a result, um, a very small payment that we can engage landowners for their time. So they can come to us, we organise meetings, we'll talk to them and we'll pay them for their time and that means we're not running into any double funding in, uh, issues with basic payment or with loss or anything like that because we're just paying for landowners to talk to us so we can try and sell them on what we're doing. Like. So when the designation of the Natura site, I mean, it's people who live and farm in the SPA in, in County Monaghan really the majority of them don't like it. It's, they don't like the designation. It, they just see it as 
as a, a negative, and they see the hen harrier as the reason for the designation, they see the hen harrier as very much a negative. You would have somebody here where I'm standing, and somebody would have a field at the other end of the room, and that person is able to plant forestry on their field, and the person in the SPA isn't able to plant forestry. And there is very little communication to us why that is the case, and people see that as, as unfair, and they just don't, they don't buy into that. And it makes the tool of designating a site very difficult when you have people and they're embattled and the people are um, people are people are put off by that and they don't want to engage with you because they see the negatives of, of how of these things are and it's good to see you know that in very much uh, you know that hopefully in the next round of designations that there'll be that can hopefully be a lot of engagement with people and a lot of explanation of, of what's going on and um, it's just, it's just that communication gulf, you know, and it, it makes things very difficult. And I have a uh, coffee with in my office, and one of the ladies who works in the council and her family have chicken farms. And again, they're trying to extend from one. When, you, when you're farming chickens, it's all about economies of scale. You want to have the more houses you have, the more profitable your business can be. And they don't understand the additional, uh, or the additional, what they see to be owners' environmental requirements that they are the steps they have to jump through when they're applying for planning permission. For to get a chicken house, well, somebody who is outside of the SBA doesn't have to jump through those hoops, and they just don't see that, and there isn't uh, that hasn't been communicated on why the importance is there, why you know why that's there. I've been told this exact sentence. That's a direct quote. I've been told that twice, and I saw a hen harrier I shoot it. And that, that's that's not that they want to actually shoot the hen harrier. That's just an attempt to rise me, to get me to react. You know, and that's coming from frustration. And one of the people who actually told me, oh, I saw him earlier, I'd shoot it. He's a farmer on the north side of the site up in Tyrone. And he's a complete a statement like that on how he actually lives is the complete opposite of how he lives. Where he, you know, one of his neighbours gave him a calf with a broken leg because he knew he'd take the calf in and he'd look after it. And he knew the calf would never make him any money, but he's happy to take it on board. He's a very nice guy. But again, he just sees that, he just sees the hen harrier as a negative, and he's only, he's only seen that as a negative. And people say, you know, what good is the hen harrier? If I want to expand my chicken houses, you know, what, what's the hen harrier going to do for me? Like? And I think we're lucky in the southern part of, the, of, of Seaf Bay in the Republic because we have the hen harrier project has started up, and that's a different initiative. And that's very much turned the hen harrier around into being a positive. If you have a hen harrier on your land, you're entitled to an additional payment if you're have a hen harrier within one or two kilometres of your land, well then you can get another payment. And if you, all the people who buy into the scheme, if their land meets the minimum requirement, well then there's a third payment. So it's starting to value that individual bird as an actual tool for additional money coming in. And that's separate to what we're doing in the CAM project. That's the hen harrier project, but that's really a positive, you know, and that's something that's really important to see something that's coming in that, you know, that. You know, it, it's 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 a start, but it's it's come. It's taken a long time to get to that point, but it's definitely a, a positive starting point. But that doesn't apply to the people in the north of the site, to the farmers in the north. And it's Sea so Bay, as we know, around the border is um is a uh, this is the hen area project there. That's just those kind of little bits. It's, the border is a is a funny place, you know. The legacy of the of the border. Um, uh, it, RTE had a program there as was It was on Choran. And they were just talking about the border, and there's one quote that really stuck with me, and that's um, the people who live along the border are only ever used to having things taken away from them, you know, and that's really you know the experience where there's only roads closed off, villages abandoned, like Mullen Village in the north of Manon, uh, which would have been the road between Mullen into Tyrone would have just been the bridge was closed, you couldn't pass that way, so the village died out. People are just used to because of the troubles having the border as very much a negative. A small number of people they would have said. If we had two borders, wouldn't we have made twice the profit? But they are working in a different, different sort of economy to the rest of us, you know? It's very much like uh, people's day-to-day -day life is, 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 is very much tied in the border. Sleeve Bay has different communities. People from different backgrounds who vote for different political parties vote north and south of the border. And they are just focused on living their day-to-day -day life. And when you have political stagnation up in the north, of Ireland, it's an issue, you know, our northern partners find that difficult, but there is no, there is, government is running at a local level, but there's no structural, no big thinking really, you know, is able to be advanced up there because it's, it's very much paralyzing. People then, they just, because of that attitude, they see anyone who approaches them from a state agency as being the one, whether you're from MPWS, whether you're from Monon County Council, the EPA, you are just representing the government and you are just another part of the organ of government and people, we're, we can be very bad at reaching out and communicating that, you know, 
I know certainly like myself that it, it takes a lot of time to explain what we're doing. We are from online county council, but we do have this bit of money and we do have the potential to um to kind of to move you know forward with this like so it's how do we kind of turn that around where's it what's the, where's the cultural heritage and what's the kind of the cultural sort of aspect to that you know and if you look at the legacy on the iron islands farming is very much it, it, people are still actively farming there in sleeve bay people are not really actively farming there are very few farmers there's people who are uh, on the northern end of the site all the farming rights were bought out in the republic there's no commonage i think it's the only county in the republic of ireland that has no commonage land within it so there isn't really any active farming of an upland site and we kind of know that if you want to manage an upland site from a fire risk point of view that animal grazing is your gold standard that's what you do and some of the learnings are how people used to do that are lost people are afraid to put animals up there they think they won't last but yeah, it's the message is that you know if you have a if you have a cow that has good bone structure already it can maintain itself and it can produce calves up there it's just getting those kind of messages out there so what we try and do is some of our works if you if you have people who are mistrusting and they've only ever had negative experiences with, uh, with, uh, with authority in an area, it's very difficult to get them to buy in. And particularly when your targets are delivering improvements in a certain area and you want to get those people to buy into that, it takes a lot of time to talk to them and, and, and chat with people because ultimately they can just say no. We can't, we don't have any ability to make someone say, we can't come on your, we can only come on someone's land with their permission so it takes time to allow them to, to you know for them to come around to that method of thinking luckily under the CAM project we do have money where we can deliver some of our habitat works we can deliver our drain blocking we can deliver our scrub removal our invasive uh, colorful removal we have funding for that so we can do that work so the people don't have to put their hands in their pockets but ultimately they see that European funding as well as uh, that money is tendered out for so we tender out for contractors to do those works and people will start to wonder, well, that money is coming into an area, it's border border area, but anyone across Europe can apply for a tender to carry out. And that is true, financial fair play. But if you're living in an area and you're wondering if anyone, if a, a job to drop, uh, if a, a job to chop down invasive pine trees in North Monaghan is advertised on the EU tenders website, they're wondering, you know, well, should that not be spent locally? Is, that, is there not a better way that we can spend that locally? And hopefully one of the, Things that we can feed back in at the end of the CAM project is more flexibility when it comes to delivering funding at a local level. Now to move on, just on the little cultural things, I think turf cutting is a very much a big issue. Turf cutting used to be um, part of everybody's, you know, in Ireland, like Pete is, 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 you know, people went to the bog when they were kids. I didn't go to the bog. We had a lot of, uh, we had a bit of turby rights in Mayo, but we, we had a lot of wood in our lands for people. Which, here's our house of wood but this is just to give you an idea this is um just a picture here and you can see the nha you can see the border so the border is very much the big thing here we have our little border line that runs right across here and you have the republic of ireland you have a stream here and then you have the north of ireland so this is all cut turf and the turf there you know, the peat there has been cut and it's been so in the north of ireland which is against the law because the peat is owned by the state in the north of ireland nobody owns that they have to turn rights there and then it's been extracted through the Republic of Ireland and sold to people in Monaghan. If you want to go and you want to enforce wildlife legislation there, your nearest forestry track that you can get to that site is maybe two kilometres away. So if you're working for the PSNI and you want to go and issue, uh, you want to try and issue some enforcement under, um, under uh, wildlife legislation, you either have to get a helicopter or you have to walk across the bog. So it's very difficult to actually enforce that because you're not cutting the turf in the republics, so you're not really breaking the law in the republic when you're when you're doing that. Like, and this isn't a case of locals, and this isn't the case of uh, you know of, of, of a lot of local people. This is one or two individuals who are speculatively cutting on a large scale and selling that turf, uh, selling that turf. So they don't own it. They don't own the turf rights. They're not even pretending to claim to own the turf rights. They make up a few odd statements about buying up shares from a co-op up in Clare, but that's not not really the case. Like, so what do we try and do is how do you link that into cultural heritage and, and one of the things we'd like to do is if you have that intangible assets, uh, the intangible cultural heritage assets and if you look at say traditional hand cutting of turf, it's not going to be, um, it's not going to uh, pay anybody to cut turf by hand nowadays if you buy a bag of turf for three euros and a petrol station and one and but it's about trying to recognise that that traditional method of turf cutting is, it's part of our heritage, it's part of our culture and, and in a lot of cases that's some of these other beds here may be being cut against people's will or without their knowledge and that turf has been cut and taken away and very much 
you're going, well, this is cutting a piece of turf. What, what negative impact is that having? But there was two hen harrier nests in the Golden Eagle Trust field that turf cutting in May last year directly led to the displacement of the hen harriers in two nests and in this picture here. So this is um, maybe, I'd say, bottom, you see a 400 meter scale bar there. So within that site, hen harriers may have been displaced by turf cutting just by the human activity of coming in and out. And so it's a gray area and uh, an undesignated period of time ago, maybe about 15 years ago, there was an attempt to issue, um, issue enforcement against some of the turf cutting in the Republic. Two weeks later, a group of people supported by local councillors marched in Nocatalan, which is the town, the community area, up in the Monaghan side, uh, pr protesting this, saying, you know, this is, a, this is non, people, local people want to have access to the turf, you know, we want to have access, and they were afraid because there was a lack of communication, they were afraid that they wouldn't be allowed to heat their homes with their turf. And if you live in a rural community, you know, you don't have a huge amount of options to, to pay the bills, and if you can get cheap fuel for your house, you will, like, and that's, you know, that's ultimately the way you do it. So where are we now? This is just to give you an idea of um, just some of the pictures of the turf. Turf just cut, left sitting out in the bog. Um, areas of just bare peat. Yeah, that's in County Monaghan. Um, and that is where the turf is taken. Uh, turf, that's the North Ireland. So that's the Republic of Ireland. Here, so and that's County Monaghan there. So it has huge damage. It has huge kind of negative effects. This is what we think of when, you know, you talk to your American cousins. Well, what do you think of turf cutting? It's Temporary jersey selling cut turf by hand, but that's not the reality. It's sausage machines cutting on a, on a massive scale. But this is kind of thing that this is our culture. We bring that into intangible cultural heritage. Um, so that's kind of my presentation. I was surely was meant to do more of the cultural aspect of this. I was trying to stick to the ecology. I'm an ecologist, but that's sort of really what I, I, I would have, you know, from, from that point of view. Thank you.